uh, cache memory policies. So far, we have figured out the different designs of cache. Now we have to understand that are there any policies which govern which cache line needs to be removed to make space for some other cache, some other some new memory address. There has to be some rule, right? If you see the fully associative cache, right? Suppose you have L cache lines, all your L cache lines are filled up. Now you get a new memory address, right? And if that new memory address does not match any of the tag bits, it's a cache miss. So out of these L cache lines, which one would you remove? Right, that is the question we need to answer. Is it just random, you randomly remove anything or are there any policies around that, right? So, so this lecture is divided into two categories, A and B. I've done that so that it's easy to follow all the pages. The first paragraph is trying to discuss what are these cache replacement policies, which help us to like evict a cache line and introduce a new cache, new, new line. Section B is on right hit and right miss, right? So the questions we are asking is, if there is a right hit, that means you want to write a value on a memory address. Now, what you do is first go to the cache to see if that variable or, or the memory or the address corresponding to that variable is already there. If it is there, it is a right hit. Now the questions you have to ask is, should I update that memory address on the cache and not bother about the main memory from where it was actually derived from? Or should I update my cache and at the same time also update my main memory so that the data are always synced? Because remember, your, your data in your cache is actually coming from main memory. So if your cache is being used for intermediate calculations in your program, if you want to store a value back onto that location, you have two options. Either you only update on the cache and not on the main memory for that point of time, or you at the same time update both the cache and the main memory with the updated value, right? So that is the discussion around how do we decide like the right hit policies, right? Reported immediately to the main memory or only when the entry is being evicted, right? So if a cache line is being evicted, then do you want to, so see, if you do not decide to push the update back to the main memory and hold on to your cache, then there would be a point in time where that line needs to be evicted to make space for a new entry. Now, do you want to wait until that time so that when you are getting evicted, only then you update your main memory or you can update your main memory every time you update your cache. So the pros and cons is, if you are updating your main memory every time you're updating your cache, it would take a lot of clock cycles. You're updating your cache, then you're running all the way, like 10 miles you're running or 100 miles you're running to get to your main memory to update for that time and then go back and then perform CPU calculation, right? So there would be a trade-off. Similarly on write misses, that means if you want to write a new value, if you write, like your program is outputting a value and it has to be written onto the cache, but unfortunately the cache is already filled up with other memory spaces. So in that case, you will suffer a write miss on the cache because your tag bits will not match. And you're saying, hey, I wanted this destination to be mapped onto the cache. Now it's not there. So it's a write miss. So now you have no choice but to go to the main memory. Now the dilemma is once you update the main memory, do you want to come back and update and push that new updated value back onto the cache because that memory was not existing on cache. It's so, that's why you suffered from a write miss. So you, so, so you have no choice but to walk 100 miles. When I say 100 miles, it's basically a lot of access time to go to the main memory. 
Now you have updated the parent location, which is the main memory. Great. Now the dilemma is, should I bring this updated memory address onto the cache? Because it was not existing. And why is, why is it a dilemma? Because of temporal locality. If your program is trying to update a value or a location, highly likely it's going to use it again. So is it in your best interest to copy that updated RAM address back onto the cache? Or you simply do not do that. And you say, every time I'm going to do that, I'm going to run all the way to the main memory. Okay, so these are the questions that these set of slides are going to pose, right? So, so part A is talking about the cache replacement. Like how, like if your caches are filled up and if your tags do not match, how are you going to decide which cache line to evict, right? Before I start this discussion, can you tell me from the three cache designs, which cache design does not bother about cache replacement, line replacement? The, the unique one. The direct mapping. Yeah. Great. Does everybody understand that? For direct mapping, this business of cache line replacement does not make sense because you always have a predefined destination which is always going to be evicted there is no there is no choice right but for fully associative and set associative because they were randomly assigned to some location hence now there is a contention on which of these needs to be removed because while placing them you placed it randomly be it a fully associative or be it a set associative in set associative the randomness is within the set right so now when it comes, when the time comes to evict a cache line, because of that randomness, now you have to create some kind of policy. So, so there are three kinds of policies. One is again random. That means if you want to evict something, randomly remove anything. <laughs> right? Like no brains, nothing, just remove anything. Okay. So, and guess what? Like in most cases it works. Sometimes like adding new circuitry to find out a logic is more cumbersome or more time consuming than randomly deciding anything and evicting it up. Right? So, but then there's another idea which is first in first out. That means the one which was assigned to a cache line, the first now has to be removed the first because it has stayed the longest in the cache, right? So if you consider cache as an apartment and you have your guests coming in, right? So you have like L guests coming in, right? So the guest who came in first, he has now served the maximum time in the cache, right? So now it's fair that the one who was first is the first one to be removed, okay? Now, this is bad when it be in cache because it does not leverage temporal locality, which basically means the one which has been mapped first might be the cache line, which is most frequently being used by your processor, right? So that's like analogy of guests, right? So you have L guests, they are at your home. Now the one, so suppose I'm your first guest and I bring it and you bring in like L minus one friends, right? So we are your L friends and we visit your home. And I, so I have decided to stay the longest because I dropped in first. Now, if I'm the one who is helping you do all the house chores, is it in your best interest to remove me if you have to accommodate a new guest? No, right? So it's not a great uh, policy because it's not using temporal locality. That means the line which is being used recently has a high chances of being used again. Hence, the best way that the mostly we configured these policies is to least recently used, which means 
if I'm the one who is doing, helping you out, planning your house and doing mostly your household chores, right? Helping you out. And then you have another guest who might have joined just a day before, right? Day before the, your house filled up, right? But they are not doing anything, right? So obviously those are, so that guest is being least recently used, right? So, so, so the one who has been staying there and has not been used for the longest time should be the one to be thrown out. Okay, not the ones who are, who are being active. So the lazy ones should be thrown out. So least recently used gives you the leverages a temporal locality. That means you have to run a counter. There is a counter which is keeping track of when a particular cash line has just been used, right? So you give a unique count value to every cash line. Now, when it comes, now when it comes to a point where a new cash entry has to be put in and somebody has to be evicted, you look at these counters and the one which has the lowest value in the counter is the least recently used. So evict that one. Okay. So in that spirit, along with the tag bits, we assign count bits, which keeps track, track of your LRU policy, least recently used policy, right? So the way to think of it is in this example, suppose you have a four way set associative cash, right? And to make matters easy, assume a single set. That means it's basically a fully associative cash, right? So you have a fully associative cash, or you can say you have a set associative cash. That means one set is there and all, that set has all the cash lines, right? Now let's say the tags issued are A, B, C, D, right? So the higher two, higher four bits or five bits, whatever you want to call it. Suppose the tags, now rather than writing a number, I'm saying, okay, A, B, C, D, right? And hexadecimal, right? So, and so A, B, C, D are being accessed in that order, right? Those are the requested, those are the new guests coming in A, B, C, D, right? Or this, that is the new requested memory with the tags A, B, C, D. Now suppose, this A, B, C, D are already existing. Suppose your cash line are already initialized with A, B, C, D. The numbers you see against them denotes that LRU count value. That means D was most recently used. That's why it has the highest value three. Again, this is not your counter per se. That means it's not incrementing by one, right? There are four cash lines in a set, I'm assigning number zero till three because every cash line or every tag, because every tag is associated with every cash line. So every tag, every or every cash line should have a unique count value because no tag, no lines can be shared at the same time, right? Because if CPU is asking for entry C, or if it's asking for entry D, then D is the most recently used. So D is three, C is zero, B is two, A is one. That is your ground state. You already have a filled cache. Now your CPU requests for tag A. Now what happens? Now A becomes the most recently used, right? So A should now get the highest value, which is three. Right? The moment A gets three, your D would get the next higher value, which is two, because D is now not the most recently used. It is the most recently used minus one, D. So D is now two, right? Your B, which was at rank two, will now fall to rank one, and C will not be impacted. Now, this may look confusing, like how are they assigning numbers? So what I thought is probably I would explain it using this structure. This is my rough work to keep track of 
which tags are being most recently used. So I have arranged it in an increasing order of priority zero till three. If something is there in rank three, or let's say three means highest value, that is the most recently used. So if you have been assigned a count zero, you have been least recently used. So the ground state or the initial state was C, A, B, D. Okay, this has nothing to do with the order here. This is just how, how to assign count value, right? So C, A, B, D, that means C was the least recently used, D was the most recently used. Now the request is for A. That means the top slot is now assigned to A. That means A would jump from here and re replace D. So D and B would fall one place down, right? So if somebody overtakes you, then you fall one place down. That, that is what exactly has happened. Now, if you see the count here, you can go back here and fill this table. So basically this was fill in the, fill in the table where the count values were blanks. Okay, so I'll take five more minutes. So your count values were all blank. So you had to fill the count values based on this access pattern ADK, right? So are there any confusion so far from the first request, which is made for A? So is this clear? You can unmute and ask questions, right? So this is now the new count, count new counting, right? C is now the, so C was anyways the release recently used. There is a, a change in sequence here, right? Now the next access is D. Now the CPU is invoking a memory address whose tag is D. Again, it will go there and luckily D exists. Okay, I forgot to mention that one, when A was issued, it had to check if A is already there or not. A was there, so it was a cache hit. A was being used. So since A was recently used, A was up, like upgraded to position this top position. Now the request is for D. Again, you look into this this chart and you have D already there. So it's again a cache hit. Now D is now the most recently used. So D would push A down, but B and C will not be, will not matter because D was here, the second spot, it will now jump to the top spot because it's just now being used, right? Now suppose there is a tag K, right? So you look into your record and you see that K was never there. So it's a cache miss. That means somebody has to be evicted. So we evict the entry, which has the least count, which is C. So C is evicted. Everybody A, D and B fall down. Sorry, A, B, D, A, B fall down and K takes the top, sp top spot because it's the most recently used now, okay? So, so I think this is more intuitive for me. After I have figured this out, I can then go back and fill the numbers here. Because here, A, B, K, D are basically, K is replacing C in this case. Because if you see here, C is the least recently used, right? So this is an example homework for you all, right? So in the same spirit, suppose we have an eight way set. So you have A to H already mapped with this ranking. Now the access pattern is A, B, A, D, K. So if you have A, again, A is, so nothing would change here, see. A had the top spot, A was recently used. But now if B is requested, there is a match. So B becomes seven, A drops one place down, remaining D would be five, E would be four, and accordingly you can update the values. So the best way is probably to create this chart and see how the, it's like a racing, right? You're racing, you, if you overtake the first person, you naturally become the first. And the first person naturally becomes the second, but it does not change the ranking of the third, fourth, and fifth is the same thing here, right? So yeah, so I'll, I will end the lecture here. I will uh, finish in the first 15 minutes, I would finish in the next lecture, the right hit policy and 
right miss policies those are like two pages so feel free to read about this okay and i will create a quiz based on so if you can follow all these examples you can solve all these examples you should be able to do the quizzes okay and also your final exams because it will be mostly numericals this time nathan question okay so first of all you can see this note here you have to introduce more number of bits for your lru counter which is again if it is a set associative cache it is log of number of ways in a set so so that means the randomness is within the set but if it's a fully associative your bits in lru counter is log number of cache lines right well i have not drawn it like yesterday i spent time drawing so because i searched online to see if there are diagrams for i assume there would be diagrams somebody might have created diagrams or regular textbooks might have diagrams for set associative hardware and all this hardware it was not there so yesterday i spent the entire day drawing those diagrams which i discussed with you today so take that opportunity now you understand how this works right now think of what the digital logic would be that is that creative aspect of this course okay if you don't know anything but you know how it works you can find out the hardware here so uh last lecture we started our discussion on cache memory policies and if you guys remember uh, the idea behind is like for few cache designs there has to be a decision made based on the requested address which cache line needs to be evicted or replaced to make way for the new request right so if you have a cache which is completely filled up and you have a new memory request coming in so a decision has to be made which cache line to be evicted right so if you take into account these three designs fully associative set associative direct mapping can you tell me from the knowledge of like whatever you have covered so far which design really does not really need a policy to decide which of the cache de cache designs doesn't need a replacement policy are there like okay people are answering on chat okay direct map that's the right answer because in direct mapping you already know which cache line you're going to because it's a directly mapped through the index so there is no confusion on which line to be evicted right whereas in fully associative because you randomly placed a line initially now you have all those l options out of those l options which line you need to evict so it will require a policy right if there is an l plus 1 request then you have to evict one of these l so it needs some brainstorming it needs a policy similarly set associative of course the set index is again fixed but within a set you have multiple ways or multiple lines within a set now again there needs to be a policy which of these ways or lines in a given set has to be removed right so again you need some policy okay so just keep in mind that direct mapping doesn't need any policy right and apart from that we also want to talk about policies for right hits and right misses so far we are talking about reading now what about if there is a right hit right right hit means you are you are seeking an address on a cache so that you can write a value that means you can update that location with a new computed value now if happens to be on the cache now decision has to be made that do you want to write it only on the cache or at the same time also reflect the changes back in the parent file which is in the main memory or do you want to wait until a time comes when that cache line needs to be evicted and only then update the main memory right so there are two types of write hits so there are two policies around uh, around write hit similarly write miss okay you request you're you're seeking an address memory address on a cache to write something and you see that none of the tags match right that means it's a write miss on the cache so you have no choice but to go to the main memory and update 
the memory address with the new value or write the value on that memory address on the main file. Now, again, you have a decision to make. Do you want to reflect those changes from the main memory to the cache at the same instant? Or you say that, hey, anyways, the whole idea was to get the updated value at the parent location and I'm already getting that. So why should I bother updating a cache? Okay. So these are the decisions you have to make in terms of write, miss, and write hits. So we're going to talk about two policies for write hits and write miss, right? So in that light, we discussed multiple uh, policies for cache replacement. So there was like random, like choose any one line you want to remove from the cache and then insert the new address, right? So it's a random policy. Then there is another first in first out, okay? But the first in first out has an issue, okay? It does not leverage temporal locality, okay? So I gave you that analogy of like, we are like multiple guests at your house, the one who helps you a lot, you need that person the most rather than even if that person was the first guest in your house, right? But the one that serves you the most, you should be able to like keep them for a longer period of time. So that's the idea behind, uh, this uh, least recently used policy, which is mostly used, okay? So the one which is not being used for a longer period of time, eventually needs to make space for a new requested memory block, right? And that leverages temporal locality, right? So we discussed this example, hopefully uh, you guys have gotten time to look into it. If not, you should definitely look into it before taking the quiz. Now, this is some kind of a table. Again, it would be given in your quizzes or in final exam. There's also in a practice set. There's also one in, a, in this like couple of slides. Yeah, there's this blank one for your homework anyways. So, so hopefully you guys know how to fill this up. Okay, so go through this uh, and these are the time, inst like these are the priorities assigned with three is the highest priority, zero is the least priority, right? One special note here is to calculate number of bits needed for an LRU counter. Now every cache line will have its own LRU count, right? So number of bits needed for each cache line can be given by this formula, which make, makes sense, right? If you have a fully associative cache and if you have 20 cache lines, or if you have like, let's say 16 cache lines, let's say you have a 16 cache lines in a fully associative cache, then that means all the 16 lines are competing. Like who wants to get replaced, right? Everyone is trying to avoid that replacement. So you have to assign a unique counter to these 16 lines. That means how many bits you need? Four bits per cache line. So per cache line, you need four bits for your LRU count. But if you talk about set associative cache, now the contention is amongst the cache lines within the targeted set. Because if a memory is issued for a set associative cache, you already know the index. You already know the set number. But within that set, you can have, let's say, W cache lines. So if you have a two-way set associative cache, then, you are com then the two cache lines in each set are competing so that they can avoid replacement. So you need to keep count of only two cache lines. Right, that means how many LRU counter you need? You need only one bit of LRU counter for each cache line, right? So in that regard, you should understand in terms of hardware perspective, the number of bits that are needed for the entire cache, okay? So this is the number of bits in an LRU counter per cache line. Okay, this was in homework, so you can feel free to solve it and discuss it on our Canvas platform. And all the details are listed here. So I've already gone over these like orally, but feel free to read more about this in detail, right? Now, now we want to discuss what happens on write request. So hopefully you appreciate that every instruction can either be a read or a write request, right? Read request means I need to read a value from a cache or a main memory and bring it to the CPU for some calculation. And the write requests are, oh, I have computed something on my ALU and then I want to 
write these updated values back in those locations, be it in cache or main memory. So in that regard, we want to discuss first handling write heads. That means the target address that needs to be written is issued by the CPU. And luckily, you have a tag match. That means the targeted address or the memory block where you want to write the instruction, write the updated value is already stored on the cache, right? So the first policy is called as write through. Now, as the name suggests, it, write, it writes through the cache. So try to like create these mnemonics in your mind so that you don't get confused between policies. Write through means something is going through it. So write through means you not only update the cache, but you also write through it and go to the next memory stage, which is the main memory to reflect the changes. Okay, so that's what it's saying. When we write to a cache line, we also update the corresponding memory block at the same time, okay, which is in the main memory. Now, the issue with this is there's always a pro and con. What is the con? What is the cons? You need to spend extra time. extra time to run all the way to the main memory during that execution of that instruction, right? Because it takes time to go from your home to your HEB. That means every time you want to store something, you're storing it in your refrigerator, but you also want to store its copy in some bigger refrigeration unit in HEB, like hypothetically speaking, right? So it's basically ties up to that. Right. Doesn't, that, doesn't that completely discount why we use a cache? I thought we were using a cache so we didn't have to go to main memory every time. Yeah, so, so but see, see here, right? So what that means is it can happen that, okay, you're writing something on the cache, right? But then as a programmer, what you should be most confident or most sure about is, does my parent file in my memory has the most updated content or not? Or do you want to just keep doing it on the cache and probably if computer crashes or something happens, then the data is lost, right? So what you want to do is, do you want to keep a track of all the updated values at the same time, right? And that's why they're, they're like need of policies. So while write through, will will run to the memory every time so that both the both the copies are in sync the cache copy and the parent copy in the main memory to keep these matched every time, okay? So that like in future, like if you want to make use of that parent copy, you have the result, right? So the benefit of a write through is you uh, at the expense of speed, you, if it crashes, it saves versus write back. Yeah, so, so, so basically it's about keeping consistent, keeping both the files consistent, okay? But mostly you guys now realize that probably if time is a critical issue in your program, you do not want your cache to, to have a write through policy if you are doing intensive calculations or anything, right? Or if, you, if you're doing something like accumulating a sum in your uh, array, like it's stupid to like, update the value of a local variable sum at every iteration because you know you're only concerned with the final sum right so in that light you have a write back policy the write back policies tells us that we update the parent memory block corresponding to a written cache line only when a time comes that that cache line is going to get evicted that means before being evicted you need to make sure the copies are consistent, right? And what is the advantage of that? Like while you're not keeping a consistent copy during every iteration, but you save a lot of time because there are fewer writes farther down the hierarchy. So less bandwidth and doing faster writes, right? So, so to be able to keep track of whether a cache line is valid or invalid, you need to introduce some extra bits. Because write back tells us that, hey, I'm not going to run all the way to the main memory after every write. The only time I would want to talk to the parent file is when 
a time comes when you're going to push me out, right? That means during this entire program execution, it can happen that I might be written only once, but then you might be talking to other folks in the cache line. So I need to keep track. If you updated me during the execution, I should make sure that I update my special bits to reflect the status of that cache line. So in that spirit, to implement a write back policy, we introduce two additional bits in your cache table. So remember your cache table has your memory block mapped. It has an extra bits for your tag and it has extra bits for your LRU counter. Now we are including an extra bit for a valid and a dirty for every college cache line. Right, so every cache line, apart from having a tag entry, apart from having an LRU count entry, it will now also have a valid bit and a dirty bit. So let's define these two, right? A valid bit is a bit indicating whether a cache slot contains useful information. That means even before your program is executing, it can happen that your cache is already pre-initialized from some older programs. But for the current program, those cache lines are not valid. The values in those cache lines are not valid. So at the setup stage, your cache lines are generally invalid. That means they do not have useful information pertaining to your current active program. So in that case, your valid bit is going to be zero, which means not valid. The moment your program loads your cache for the very first time from the main memory for a given program, then the valid bit is changed to one. That means, hey, now what I have in my cache is pertaining to the current program execution, right? So that is the meaning of valid bit. Now, dirty bit, well, if dirty bit is true, that means the cache has been updated, but the parent record in the main memory has not been updated, right? So dirty bit of value, man, uh, value one tells us that cache line was written and therefore has a more recent copy of data than the memory block. Whereas a dirty bit of zero means that both the records are consistent, cache and its corresponding memory block in the main memory, right? So, so these two extra bits come into play because of the write back. Because somebody has to give you an indication whether the cache is dirty or not, right? In the write back policy. So, the modified, I'm going to just show you, show you an illustration of what the modified diagram looks like. If you have a two way set associative cache, right? And suppose we have like four sets and every set has two lines or two ways. So here the two ways are shown like adjacent to each other. So line zero and line one are within set zero and within set one, you again have two lines. So basically you have eight line cache, two way means four sets. So you have four sets. Now see, you already had a tag and a cache data block. The two new bits being introduced are B and D, valid and dirty. Now, what is that impact on your detecting a miss or a hit? Remember you had a comparator circuit where tag was being compared to the tag bits, right? Now that tag, if the tag matches, you also have to make a decision if it's a valid bit or not. That's why there's an AND gate before you detect a hit. Earlier, the hit was detected directly after the comparison. If the tag matches your requested tag, then it's a hit. That's what we learned. But now, because we have to also think about right misses, we want to keep track of the validity of the line. That means if the valid bit is zero, and even though your tags match, it's basically a cache miss because those tags which were matching are from some data which is not valid for the current program. That's why there's an AND gate and a output of this comparator. So it has, this has to be true and this has to be true. Only then it would be a hit or a miss. Okay, and similarly, all these cache designs can be changed. You just have to add, put on AND circuit, right? So, Let's consider this example. 
So suppose you have a single line cache initialized as follows. So tag is A, so I've just written in hexadecimal, tag is A, right? Or sometimes it's easier to not bother about actual addresses, but just refer, refer them with some alphabets, right? So if you have a tag A valid zero dirty one, okay? Now let us consider an address access pattern as this. So you're reading tag A, then you're reading tag B, then you're writing an address with a tag B, then you're reading from an address who has a tag C, then reading from an address which has a tag D, and then writing onto that address which has a tag D. So that is the access pattern. The question asked is, what are the final values of tag valid and dirty bit, right? So if you have this one map, which is keeping track of what you are reading and writing, right? So you only have a single line cache, then what is the final value of tag valid and dirty? How many misses occurred in total? How many cache misses has occurred in total? And how many write backs occurred in total, right? So the steps to do this is you have initial state A0 and one, right? And then we are going to follow the access pattern and see what the statuses are going to be. It should be very intuitive. Let me know if there are any concerns while we are discussing this. So read A, that means an, an address has been issued that I want to read from an address which has a tag A. So although we have a tag match in A, we still declare it a read miss since the valid bit is zero. So that this is the classic example of tag matching, but the valid bit is zero. That means this AND gate has come into picture. So this line is true, but this tag bit is zero from an invalid cache line. So it's going to be a miss. So your tag is going to still be A. You're, you're going to update your miss as one. And now that you have loaded an address from the memory, right? It now becomes a valid data. It's a valid line now, right? Because a request has been issued from the memory or from the CPU to grab this new, uh, grab this uh, tag. So, so, so you have run all the way to the main memory, brought this address, which has a tag A, and now have replaced this initial tag A with this current tag A, and now it is a valid bit, right? And there is, and it is not dirty because you have just gone to the main memory to read this instruction and bring it to the cache. So it has the same consistency with your main memory, right? So your dirty bit is zero. There is no write back because it was a read instruction. So there was nothing to be written back onto these cache lines. Now, another instruction being issued is read B, the next instruction. Now this should result in a read miss. Why? Because the tags do not match. There is a single cache line. So tag B does not match with the tag A, right? So we service the miss. So there's another miss, so one plus one is two, and put B in the tag. Valid is one, why? Because you ran all the way to the main memory to bring this B. And again, dirty is zero because the, both the lines are consistent, the cache line and the memory block. And again, there is no write back because it was a read instruction. Now the next instruction is write B. That means CPU has done some funky calculation and it wants to write it on a location with the tag B. So where should it go? First, it should look into the cache. Now, when it looks into the cache, the tag matches, right? So this is a, right hit, right? Now validity still remains one because it's the current program you're anyways running, right? But now dirty is set to one. Since now the line will be assumed to be written in the cache, why? Because it has a write back policy. It is not a write through policy, it's a write back policy. That means it's not going to update your main memory at the same time. Hence, you want to issue that this line is dirty. That means it, it, it is storing some updated content, right? You can think of it as that small star that appears on your file when you do not save the file, right? So it basically means that's that indication, like it's dirty, 
until un until unless you reflect the changes back into the main block it's not going to go to zero so you get a dirty one you're missed two right but again write back is still zero because it's a write back policy now there is read c instruction that means again you run all the way to the cache and see if this c line is there or not so c and c is matched to the current tag which is b it's a tag mismatch so this means it's a so you're saying it's a re, yeah it's a read c right so if it's a read c it's a miss it's basically a miss because you want to read it right now see there's only one cache line and your instruction is read c that means it has now gone to the main memory to bring this c now before bringing the c into this cache the b line has to be evicted but then b line also has a dirty bit that means it needs to write back for the first time that means from the cache update the memory tag b in the main memory and only after that you bring in the information of c so your write back has updated to one because you have you you went all the back to the main memory to update your b so write back is one miss is two plus one three all right read d again d is compared to c it's a read miss so your miss has increased your d10 still remains the same it's a read so you don't have to worry about the dirty dirtiness but the valid it's still valid because it's from the current program execution so if you see the valid bits never change it's only during the setup phase that it might be invalid but then it's mostly valid if it's cross it's doing the same program if it's running the same program with multiple instructions finally you do a write d then you look at the cache and d and d match right so valid is one and dirty is set to one right so your d one and one right and that's what's the last command so that is the last status of your cache block d10 with four misses and one write back okay okay just take time to go over this again and uh, i think the details are there listed to help you out and you can review the recording let me look, quickly look into the chat yes whenever we write to a cache we set a flag as one so when cache line gets kicked out we know we need to update them in exactly it's that it's your flag entry right uh adrian valid is valid is whether data is important could be data from previous program dirty is the cache is I, yeah dirty is the cache is ahead of the main memory right valid is whether data is important right yes perfectly fine could be from there exactly okay uh Zach Samir, is it clear? Dirty versus valid? Yeah, I got it now. I was just going a little fast. <laughs> okay, valid means validity of the data. Dirty means it's not. I think yeah. Uh, Nathan and Adrian did a great job in synthesizing everything in these one liners, right? So dirty is the cache. Cache is ahead of the main memory. If you can remember that, you know what dirty is. Valid is whether data is important or not. right great finally the last topic uh, in this uh, discussion is write miss so the so, so the discussions we were talking were related to policies of valid and dirty for write back right now for the write miss right so if it's a write miss it basically means you want to update some value in a block but unfortunately that block does not exist in your cache so what do you do so you don't sit and cry in the cache you have no chance but you have to walk that 100 miles all the way to the main memory no questions asked okay so you walk to the main memory you burn up all those clock cycles right but then there is a decision to be made whether you want to come back and bring that updated block to the cache and why do you think somebody wants to bring back that updated value into the cache 
any ideas? Like you have gone all the way to the main memory. You have updated it there. Why do you think somebody would be interested to bring that memory block and store it into the cache? Maybe it wasn't used for a while and then it was finally used later on. No, it was just recently used. It was recently used to write a value. But then if the value has been written to the parent directory in the main file, why would somebody bother bringing it to the cache? Why should such a policy ever exist? It, it could be used again. It could be used again. What kind of property is that? It's a temporal locality, right? That means if something has been accessed to be written, highly likely because of the temporal locality that it can be accessed again. So I do not want to do the same mistake of not finding it in the cache and running again to the main memory. So I have suffered once. I've gone all the way to the main memory, updated it. But who knows, because of the temporal locality, the processor might need it again. So it is in my best interest to carry that updated memory block and bring it to the cache, okay? So this is called as write allocate. Every time there is a write miss, bring the block to the cache as well. Why? To take advantage of temporal locality, right? And if you decide that, hey, I'm not going to bring back this updated memory block to the cache, okay? That is called as no write allocate policy. So on a write miss, you just write to the main memory and do not bother about returning the cache block. So you're taking a gamble, okay? Now, what is the benefit of it? The slight benefit of no write allocate is this results in a fewer spurious evictions, right? That means, remember, if you are doing write allocate, you are bringing your memory block to your cache. That means somebody from the cache has to be evicted to make way for this new incoming record, right? Suppose your cache was already filled up, right? It was, it was already filled up. That's why it was a write miss. So you went back to the main memory and you decide that, okay, I'm going to write, write allocate it. That means I'm going to bring it back. Now somebody has to make way for it. Now, what is no write allocate telling you that it might be that you are evicting something, some existing record in the cache with this new block, but this new block that you're bringing in might never be used again. So it's called a spurious eviction. That means you have, just for the sake of making sure that you have a cache and a memory both at sync, you have thrown out something from the cache and this new guy that you have brought in probably might never be used. So it's called a spurious eviction. So that is a slight benefit of no write allocate. That means you only run to the main memory and update it on demand. So you are taking, you're taking that gamble. Okay, I'll always run to the main memory if again, there's a write mess. But the hope is probably you do not, you won't have to run it, run all the way there, right? So yeah, so, so these are two different, it's based on probabilities. So write allocated, no write allocated. I hope these two are clear now. So uh, one is you just write to memory only and then the other is you write to memory, but you also just update the cache. Um, on write miss, you write to the memory every time because it's a right. write on the cache. But then do you bring it to the cache? If yes, it's a write allocate. Okay. And if you do not bring it to the cache, it's no write allocate. Okay, yeah, so these are like proper definitions. Sometimes it's easier to understand these two policies, but the name naming conventions are kind of Year, right, right, allocate. So the, the way I learned this is it's a write because you're writing a value. Allocate means the memory is allocating a block on the cache. And the negation of that is no write allocate. Okay. So in that regard, there's like this last discussion on this cache, which talks about how do you want to write a software program which leverages these kind of localities. That means you want to make sure that you get as many cache hits as possible. Because if it is not a cache hit, you have to go to the next higher level memory. 
So typically after a cache, the next higher level memory is a main memory. But again, in modern computers, cache exists in multiple layers. It's not that direct. It's not just cache and a main memory. So you try to bridge these gaps by introducing multi-layer caches as well. So there's an L1 cache, L2 cache, and L3 cache, where L1 cache is closest to the CPU, L3 cache, which is larger than L2, which is larger than L1, is sitting closer to the main memory. So these are your like multi-stages design of cache as well, right? So just keep that in mind that if somebody asks you that, hey, do you have only one cache or stages of cache, just stages of cache. I, I would really recommend you to guys to go and watch the Apple's M2 chip, all the, like on November 10, I think they had this release, right? The new Mac line with M2 chip. So it's a system on chip where they bring in the processor, cache, main memory into a single chip rather than having them distributed in a computer. So that SOC design is very conventional. It's, it's, it has existed. So the Apple is transitioning to creating its own processor chips starting this new Mac line. Before that, it depended on Intel, NVIDIA to supply their graphic cards. So you would have a traditional design where you have a separate processor in the motherboard. Then there would be few cables which would be connected to a memory and all that. But now they have packaged everything into their own custom chip or an SOC. So there, if you go and watch that uh, small section where they talk about their M2 chip, I think this course should uh, make sense when you're going to over that uh, discussion on how that M2 chip is configured. You will see that they talk about cache lines. They will show you cache lines. They will show you an eight core CPU. That means a CPU has eight cores. Then they will show you a DRAM. So they also bring a RAM inside that one chip. So, so one thing that people have been complaining is it's a move where you cannot upgrade your RAM anymore because it's now integrated into your system. And the idea here is when you integrate everything into a small block, the distances have reduced, the power consumptions have reduced. That's why the newer Mac lines they claim has like 19, 20 hours of battery. Okay, so watch that. Hopefully you guys can now appreciate a lot of things which probably you used to like take it for granted or not, never bother like pausing and looking into it. But now you will see these uh, spec sheets of computers and phones when you're buying a new one. See how much cache they have, how much RAM they have, right? So you will see that, okay, it's an eight-way set associative cache with 128K lines of cache. So that should hopefully make sense after these discussions. So these two examples are basically showing you how do you want to write your array? You have a matrix and you're traversing a matrix, right? It's a two-dimensional array. So if you're calculating some of all the elements, the first one is talking about, you have an outer loop, which goes through the width, right? And the inner loop goes through the heights, right? So width comma height. So if you see here, it's a less friendly because your cache, because your array stores values in contiguous bytes in a cache line. So, a more friendly approach is to have your uh, height inside. Yeah, your x is, sorry, your width inside, right? So your height comma width, right? So height is your height, width is your width, right? Uh, width is your like horizontal, uh, like if you slice it, hopefully you trying to, un uh, let me just draw it, right? So they are calling this as width. This is height. So it is in your interest to write a loop which accesses like this. Because this is how the data is stored in one chunk. And that is leveraging your spatial locality. Okay. Because you are stepping through an array. Otherwise, if you if you write your program which is accessing top to bottom in this array, then each of these entries are a different cache line, right? So there's always going to be a cache miss, cache miss, cache miss, right? So what you can do as a homework, like as a fun homework is write these two codes 
include the time calculations. So you can use a library for clock and have a start clock and end clock before this and actually calculate a time and then vary H and W to a higher value. You start from a 10 cross 10 and go all the way to like 1000 cross 1000 or, or million cross million and plot that graph. Okay, if you have time, if you really want to see how a small flaw in your, it's sort of logical flaw. Remember both, both of them are logically correct, but just a small tweak in your logic can save you tons of time, right? So this is all about designing cash friendly algorithms. Okay. All right, so any questions so far? Yes, Nathan. In one of this? So basically what we do is like for write through, of course, you will not need your dirty bits because you're always updating both the copies, right? So even if you're, if you even if you have a dirty bit allocated, it's always going to be zero. Yeah, valid bit depends on at the initial stage, just like Adrian was saying, right? Like even before the program starts, what if you have a pre loaded cache with some garbage value, which is from an older program. Then your cache lines, so every time you run a new program, everything in your cache is made invalidated. And the first time you request something in your new program, there's always going to be a miss because of the valid bit being false. So it will always have to go to the main memory to bring the first few memory addresses. And then your program kicks in and if there are any loops in your program, which is reusing those variables, then it is in your best interest to have those on caches. Great. So let's okay. move on to, yeah, question. Do you mind scrolling down to the, the table? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to write the values down. So these are already there, right? You, you have the PDF access from the module. Oh, yeah.